Hey, what's up? This is Mark Sutru. Thanks for sending in the questions for this Slap Pals interview. Monkey McPa asks, so the Switch 360 flip wasn't the hardest part about the four tricks you did on the double set in the NY section of Verso? Yeah, the Switch tray wasn't the hardest, but like, it's, uh, I just, for that section, I really wanted it to be a, a neat progression of tricks, just just because it's like a song, you know, like a chord progression. It's not necessarily about difficulty, I guess. In a way it is, but you know, everybody's different. For me, the nollie, it's subjective. it's subjective. For me, the nollie was pretty much just as hard as the switch tray, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit easier, but I'd never really nollied anything big. So the nollie was definitely harder than the backside. It goes nollie, backside flip, varial heel, switch tray, and then nollie, was harder than the backside flip and the varial heel for sure. The reason we put it like that is just because it gets more complicated and cool looking, I guess. It is for difficulty reasons, but it's not my difficulty reasons. What's Indian tooth powder? Indian tooth powder is what Yaje tried to pass off to me as toothpaste when we were rooming together in Canada. I was like, hey, could I, could I, could I borrow your toothpaste? I forgot some, and he handed me a little canister of some powder. It's like, all right, I'm good. <laughs> Tell us some of your favorite Janowski quotes. I wish I knew, I should have texted him the fucking, the ambition one. It's like zero ambition, zero goals, <laughs> just live, or something like that. Stefan makes a lot of art. I asked him what he thought of Jim Carrey's art, because it's super funny and like, it's not necessarily good. I asked him what he thought of it, just because we were talking for a while, and he goes, dude, I fucking love it, it's amazing. Well, I don't, it's, it's just like Zulander said. You know, somebody asked him in an interview, Who's your favorite musician? He says, Sting. I don't listen to his music, but the fact that he makes it, I really respect that. <laughs> Tell us about meeting Billy Rohan for the first time as a kid. Meeting Billy Rohan, it was like the first time that I came out to skate in New York. I was, I was 13 or 14 on a family vacation, skating the Brooklyn Banks, probably doing some tech tricks in the SXLs on the Banks. And uh, he just skated with me for a little bit, skated that flat bar that used to be there. And then he took me over to where the small banks are. He just like showed me a little bit of the history of the place. And then he's like, when you get big and famous, remember me. And uh, flash forward like 10 years and he's emceeing the, the Adidas demo that we put on at Tompkins when Away Days was premiering. So that was sick to come full circle. Big Baby Jesus asks, Fred Gall is the best skater ever. All right, fuck yeah. Get him on the Adidas team. Damn, I wish I could. I like when he skates in Adidas. He looks super good in them. What are your top three favorite books? Marilyn Robinson's Housekeeping, W.G. Sabal, The Rings of Saturn, and Jesse Ball, The Way Through Doors. I don't know if that's my favorite of Jesse Ball's. All of his work is my favorite, but that's a good place to start. When can we expect your third Adidas shoes to drop? Any info on it? We got some stuff in the works. The COVID shit put an end to one project we had going, but something will probably be dropping in about a year. Have any companies tried to poach you from Habitat? Yeah, definitely, but uh, I'm not gonna name them. Fuck that, staying loyal. Mitch Niche 191 says, hey Mark, big fan. What's your top three favorite skate spots? SF Library, for sure. I remember the first time I skated there, I was in eighth grade, skated there on a weekend, and I was just so fucking fascinated by the spot that that Monday in math class, I was just like trying to draw it all out on, in my notepad, like, <laughs> Just trying to figure it, like, because the ledges ground so well and they were so low. As an eighth grader, I could skate it all day. And the ground was just so fucking good. Little two stairs everywhere. So, SF Library, Love Park for sure. And then I love uh, British skate spots. I like South Bank, but it's not quite my favorite. I would put uh, Lloyd's and Bristol up in there. Front crook tips. So, I suck at front crooks. I can do them, but. A lot of the time I'll ollie and my board will kind of disappear from my feet and then I'll s slam my foot onto the ledge and just go flying. I learned them from Ann Travis back in the day, like in 2010. I learned them from him, but I didn't quite get him. Like he told me to pigeon toe my front foot and that worked wonders back then, but still like my foot would fly off. So recently, a couple months back, I ate so much shit doing that that I just hit up Sean Malto and and uh, Jamie Foy, I DM'd him at the same time and showed him the slam and I was like, yo, you guys help me out here. What the fuck am I supposed to do? 
I asked him if, if I should be ollieing straight into it, like you do a regular crooked grind, just like dive right in, or if you should do the ollie above and come down on it. And I thought the key was to make it like a back, like a backside crooked grind. But no, they said ollie above it. They said you have to hang your toe over the side, which I've seen Jamie do that in person. At contests, he hangs his front toe over the heel flip side of the board. I always thought that just looked funny and like was unnecessary, but I started doing that and that's the key. So how are your front foot on? The thing is, when you ollie, your foot is spread out over the board like it's monkey gripping it. More of your foot hits the top of the nose so that there's no like, it's not like your toe hits the nose and would make the board flip and go away from your foot. Very detailed response. I hope it helps. Pizza Flip to Fakie asks, You've spoken at length about the intent of Verso being a more mindfully crafted part than a barrage of clips, and it certainly shows. Are there any recent parts that you would consider, for lack of better terms, also thoughtful? Yeah, I think, I think there's tons of thoughtful skate video parts. Like anything, obviously anything where I see something that's never been done is super thoughtful. I'm like, oh fuck, I never thought of that one. This is trick-wise. People are starting to do tricks that you would never have thought of. Not MBDs, but like Mango, manual downhill on the sidewalk and then the sidewalk lifts up and there's a three stair so that the road goes flat and he ollies down the three to manual and then the, it continues to like a seven but then he ollies back over the, that curb into the street again and it was just like such a good way to make that spot a spot it, it wasn't it's only a three stair down a hill you're cooking for sure so it's like a, a gnarly spot to skate even if you were just gonna like kick flip the three but it wouldn't really be a normal, like that wouldn't really be a clip. But when he manuals it, which is something I never would have thought of, he unlocked the spot. Recent part, like anytime there is a section break, so where people are doing like, not like quote unquote a concept section or anything, but just when it begins to be a little bit more thought out, like Chris Weimer, when he does those kickflip tricks in a row back to back on rails, like kickflip backsmith, kickflip frontsmith, it shows you that for a couple months at least, he was definitely thinking like, all right, I wanna do I wanna do the front side and the back side and show him that I have this control and I can kickflip into whatever the fuck I want. What do you think about Arto Saro's back Arto Sari's back five oh back one eighty? The big ass ledge off the drop. That was a sick one. I really like the way it was filmed. The colors in that clip are good and the white wall like turns it into a kind of like geometric composition, but I don't know, like it's, Arto, nothing he could do would ever make me bummed. Every single part of, he did a kickflip indie over a hip and I was like, that's so sick that Arto did that. Because I don't like that trick. <laughs> but when Arto does it, it's like, oh, he's like, he's more uh, well-rounded than than you might have thought. You get a lot of shit for that, the backside five or back plane. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I think I think it's funny because I, I figure every fucking skater has their likes and dislikes. <laughs> I guess the back 5 back 180, I just didn't realize that people like that trick because I was just told as a kid, like, don't do that trick. I was like, hey, could I, could I film a line? What do you want to do? Um, I was thinking like back 5 back 180 and then fake your nose grind, shove it. And they're like, uh, dude, maybe another trick? <laughs> so I just, I just had internalized it. Yeah, I just have this specific viewpoint and I let it show and, and it was an unexamined kind of thing. But yeah, that back 5 back 180 is sick. It's just that when, I, when you do it back, to me, when you do a back five back 180, it's like you kind of, most of the time you drag. I've seen people do it where they go a straight balance back five zero and then they ollie and quick turn it around, like when they have to get over something and that looks sick as fuck. But when you do a long back five zero and skid back, it reminds me of when those like freestylers will go across the course on their tail, just like fish tailing back and forth. Yeah, it's just like, a bad flavor in my mouth but i like the way arto lands yeah i mean it's a really gnarly spot too and you'd be scared of uh having your board slip over on the deck and like going off the as on any out ledge that was that was a sick one though but uh if he had done backsmith back 180 i think i would have liked that a little more uh slug loaf says asks favorite tv show i don't really have a favorite tv show i don't really watch tv but uh I watch a lot of movies. I really like French movies. There's this movie, Hiroshima Mon Amour, that's super heavy. It's it's about the war and it's about French people in Japan after Hiroshima. And uh, but it's like so well done and it's it's just fucking amazing. Do you think you could ever one up Verso or was that your peak? I think it was 
I, I was kind of trying to make it my peak, just in case that just in case I didn't have another one. We'll say that that's my peak. Maybe I can, but I don't think I would ever do anything like that again. I think it would be uh, gnarlier tricks or more handrail tricks. Like that's kind of what I would do, you know. Maybe it would be a big long part like that, but it wouldn't be as conceptual or like, or maybe who knows? I have no idea. <laughs> Point and click asks best teammate on Habitat and best on Adidas. Doesn't matter for what though. It could be travel skating, etc. Best teammate on Habitats. Stefan and Silas have both like shown me the most. Like they've fucking taken me through so much in my life. They're both such good role models too. I've probably been on more trips with Silas though, so I'm gonna go with Silas. Uh, and best on Adidas, Frankie Spears. We always skate together here in New York and elsewhere on trips. Super gnarly, but he can really do any trick he wants. So, homegrown83 asks favorite spot in New York and why? I really like spots where you can kind of where you have everything, and in New York it's a little hard to get that. I like New York as a whole more than I like it for just the favorite spots. But um, Flushing is a classic one, but it's just so far that I never. Every time I go there, I'm like, oh, this is an ordeal, and that kind of taints my my day, even though I have a lot of fun. And then I really like the Plaza at 29th and 6th with uh, it's in Chelsea. It's with the three stair out ledges. It's great granite ledges. Some people call it Big Screen Plaza. Fred Gall stories. I have way better Fred Gall stories that have been told to me. <laughs> but as far as the ones that happened with me, the coolest one was that like right around the time that I got on the team, the first trip I think we were on, we went to Boston and on the way stopped at uh, John Gardner's parents' house where they were, they were demolishing the pool. So we skated the pool and they were demolishing the whole house. So we were taking sledgehammers to the walls and throwing rocks through the windows. We were all in the house and Freddie is like breaking something. Hands me the sledgehammer, I take it, I break it, and then he hands me the Hennessy. And he's like, take that, Suju, let's see you down. Or something like that. I just take a swig, whatever. But like, shit was so funny to me. Just because I, I felt welcome, but also just this really amazing overlay of two different lifestyles coming together without friction. The Canadian suit says, big fan, what roadside restaurant do you stop at most during your cross-country drives? I'll do diners all the time. I roll through to a diner and just like the same thing every day. No matter the state I'm in, Arizona or Georgia or whatever, it's just fucking hash browns or home fries, some sort of potatoes, two eggs, scrambled and uh, toast. Gets you going, black coffee. Favorite meal to cook at home? I, I really like cooking tempeh. Tempeh is good as shit. Throw some uh, tamari sauce on there or a barbecue sauce. Do some quinoa. Uh, worst snowstorm you've ever experienced? Probably, I think the first, the worst one was the first one, but that made it the sickest one because I moved to Philly in 2013 and that winter was really, really heavy. But uh, I was just studying, so I don't remember it being like bad because I was just indoors. Last winter though, there was this fucking amazing day. It was a snow squall. We were all like, what the hell is a snow squall? Because it, it, we got the the alert warning on our phones like warning 3 to 5 p.m snow squall and we're like what the fuck like it wasn't really even cold that day and we went skating not a cloud in the sky slowly these crowd these clouds creep in but we just see like a wall of snow of, of snow clouds but also snow coming at us and all of a sudden the temperature drops and we're in a fucking a blizzard at 5 p.m and it's all it's night and snowy that was so sick because we actually got to skate that day too warm-up zone mark you seem to spend more time skating with alien workshop riders frankie brandon yaje than anybody on the habitat team how interconnected are Habitat and Alien right now as businesses and teams? Fred Gall is the only pro to ride for both companies, I believe. Would it be a betrayal for you to transfer over to the Alien team officially? Would it really change much for you? I feel like it would give Alien a boost while not hurting Habitat all that much and help re reconnect the brands again. That's a cool idea, but uh, the brands are connected. It's like the same thing. I always skate Alien boards. Frankie skates Habitat boards. I, it's, it's confusing to me why people don't realize. They always say like, dude, what? You're skating an alien board? You should get on. As if I'm skating like a girl board. I, I think the fact that we that I ride for Habitat and my friends, most of my friends like in the my age range ride for like Joey and Brandon and Yajay ride for Alien. I think that makes it good because you don't want all of us on the same team. They're in the same warehouse. Joe Castrucci does Habitat and Mike Hill does Alien. So they're different in that sense. But the, it's the same people like 
getting the graphics and onto the boards or whatever and talking to the distribution. If everything goes well, like we're trying to figure it out post COVID, but we had plans to open up a showroom at the warehouse in Ohio, just a, a place to have products, alien and habitat and sell coffee and shit. That was a cool idea. Hopefully it'll happen after COVID. Machu asks, what's the name of the shifty alley-oop 180 you do in away days? Very tasteful maneuver. That's not me. That's Brandon. That's a regular footer. <laughs> All right. People think I did it switch or they just think I, I don't get that one. That's Brandon. And uh, I don't think he has a name for it. It's a shifty backside shifty front 180. I fucking love that trick. He can also do it to front side lip slide on handrails. The Lurper asks, why'd you do the switch 50 50 at the Olympic challenge a second time? The dime glory challenge. I did it twice because the first time I didn't lock in. I don't know if people could see that at the top, my back truck decked out and then rode into it yeah and only the back truck it was it was a funny thing to have to uh meet your personal standards when the whole fucking sea of people is psyched that you did the trick you've been trying for 30 minutes no i had to redo it just because i was pretty sure that some people could tell i mean i wanted to do it too it would i would have you know felt weird if i had left with that crazy of a trick and i didn't even lock it what was your favorite part of the olympic challenge that was probably my favorite part because i was so hyped i did that and I, I was feeling so good that just 50ing it, jumping on it was like, oh, it's no problem. I love that feeling. Skating into the big bank was really fun too from the deck because at first it was like, damn, is this gnarly? Can you do it switch? And then since it was so, the session was so hyped, I just like, I think I didn't even roll down a regular first. I think I just went down the switch and it was dangerous. Remember that Tom Knox fall? From the top, yeah. Fuck. The Amazing Grace song or whatever it was playing. In the arms of an angel. <laughs> Health insurance. Do any of your sponsors offer it or help out in some way? Do you pay it out of pocket? How do you do how do you negotiate being a skater and needing wanting to go to the doctor? As a skater, I don't get health insurance from anyone because I'm I am self-employed. I'm an independent contractor. So that sucks. I think the only company that does health insurance is Red Bull. I'm not sure though. Like uh, Will Marshall, DC Canada, I think they hooked him up at one point with a knee surgery or something. If you never found skateboarding, what would you be doing with your life? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I would be going to school and writing or maybe I would be doing something else athletic. My family is, um, my mom's a doctor, a hand therapist. My dad's an engineer. My brother is, he, he works in tech and he went to school, he got a master's. My dad got a PhD, mom got a master's. So I think I probably would have ended up getting a master's at some point, but I feel like I was always a little bit more athletic than my brother, so I might have found some other physical kind of kinetic outlet. Fuck, tennis is really bougie. I don't know if I would have done that. <laughs> I used to do it when I was a kid, but... Stanley Spadowski asks, what's your setup? Boards, trucks, wheels, sizes of them. So uh, I ride a Habitat board, 32 long, 8.25 wide. Don't know the wheelbase. It's got a pretty square nose and a pretty pretty tall nose. Very, very steep. Trucks are 148 Thunders. I like them when they have the small base plate, the one that's really thin and looks smooth. And then they're hollow on the kingpin and on the axle. Wheels is 53, the conicals, F-Force. Oh, and then bearings are bone Swiss. Oh, and Jessup, I ride the Super Jessup. I skate for them. I don't pop my shields. Sometimes I do, I guess. <laughs> But I think they, they, uh, they get shittier faster like that. I don't know. I don't put stickers on my board. I don't like that. Sometimes I do, but, but I never really... I think boards look really sick without stickers. They feel better too. I don't like the feeling of stickers. I don't do anything weird to my grip, although I kind of want to start doing uh, what Dennis Buznitz did in, in uh, Seeing Double, I think. He like spray painted the edges of his grip white. As a kid, I thought he had just sanded the shit out of his board and somehow it stayed there. And it was still white from sanding and he just did that line first try. But I think he spray painted the sides. Doom Station 55, what was your favorite trick you had in Palace Fun? I can't remember all of them right now, but I think one of the ones I was most stoked on was when I did a back lip to switch front crook fakey flip on a butter bench ledge. I was really psyched on that and that was probably the only one of those clips that I filmed just with my friends at home. That was right next to Joey Guevara's house and we lit it up, skated it for hours. The other tricks that I did in that video part, it wasn't my video part, it was Aldrin Garcia's. Uh, 
I spent some some weeks in LA trying to get these insane tricks that for me they were insane they were like the very hardest thing I could possibly do and I would try for four hours and it was like a really intense part of growing up <laughs> to do that so it wasn't ex exactly fun <laughs> Did you ever talk to Bobby Pulio after your Adidas Philadelphia part came out? Yeah, I did. He, um, but it was a long time after. He came up to me on the street like a year ago. Or no, I went. I saw him and I just said hi. It was, I, I was just going to say hi and like keep going or like ask him how his day was going, whatever. But he, he brought it up and he's like kind of apologized and explained himself. And it was definitely a little bit like uh, the explanation was, you could tell that he wasn't reformed. He didn't mean the apology, he just had to apologize. I don't know, it was cool. I see him sometimes, he's, he's a cool guy. Do you have any guilty pleasure type books you like? Something not on par with your course of study but fun to read? I actually don't really, I don't really, I don't really read guilty pleasure books. I never fucking... Jason Dill asked me the same question. I remember we were talking about books and he's like, but don't you ever just read like... Comics. Not comics, but some, like, uh, probably asked me some mystery writer. Yeah, I didn't have an answer for him. I just, I really like, the reason I read books is because I'm psyched, I'm psyched to uh, get into what these people are, are thinking about and that drives me to pick up the next book, you know, being like, like, fuck, what was going through this author's head and how do they make it seen and then how does it relate to the other authors of this time and here he goes. <laughs> drive by but I have nothing against guilty pleasures Chuck Ramon is your next part gonna be called recto no the idea was that the beginning of my career was recto the front of the page is the recto and the back of the page is the verso but then when you open a book on your left is the verso because that's the back of the page before and on your right is the recto so that might make you think that there's a recto coming but that I didn't mean for that to be that way can you speak about can you speak a bit about your upcoming video project? Thank you. I'm working on a couple different ones. We got a lot of clips in New York during the during like the, the original quarantine. A lot of spots that we hadn't been able to skate, so I'm really excited for that part. But I've been working on a part with with Justin Albert for longer than longer than the last two years. So like some of the footage is stuff that didn't quite make it into Verso. So there's still leftovers? There's still leftovers, but uh the reason they're leftovers is like really particular reasons that I don't think meet, that don't fall beneath the difficulty standards. It's like maybe we had too many fucking heel flips. Not that I would, but uh, I think it was switch heels. There's a line in St. Louis I do that had a switch heel. We couldn't use it because of that. That one I'm psyched. It's going to have more SF stuff. And then I'll eventually finish up the Spitfire part, the Spitfire part that I started this summer but wasn't able to finish because I bruised or maybe even broke my ribs I don't know but it took a long ass time to heal probably just bruised but I would have had a part come out instead of just those three clips with the one long line but it didn't work out so that'll come next year probably and then uh, another part with Mulhern I have a bunch of footage just because like I don't know it's traveling this year is hard and even skating this year can be hard so the only thing that would have been good to finish this year was the Spitfire part to have have it coincide with me getting on the team, but I just wasn't able to do it because I was only in California for actually a couple months. It should have been long enough, but the ribs took me out for like eight weeks. NDSR asks, who's your favorite Sunnyvale Park local? Can you share any crazy Sunnyvale Park moments? Sickest Sunnyvale Park moment was I was skating there on a rainy day that seemed like maybe it was about to rain again. There were puddles everywhere. So there was really nobody at this park. And uh, Jesse Erickson, legendary tilt motor, rolls through and he's tall as shit, normally shaved his head and had a big ass beard. So very, very unapproachable looking, but clearly a fucking, an insanely talented skateboarder. Pretty much like for me, what Arto and Jake Johnson are for the rest of the world now. But for me back then, that was Jesse Erickson. Loosest trucks ever, he's rolling around and some kid's board, there's three people there, some kid's board flies out of the out of the bowl and in just the most miraculous, unexplainable movement and gesture I've ever seen, he snatched the board out of thin air at the full extension of his arm and brought it back down without moving a muscle of his face and just tossing it back at the kid in a, in a nice way, but like, I don't even think he looked at the board either, just kind of caught it, head high, right on the nose. 
top favorite Sunnyvale Park local for sure, but maybe Andrew Pearl. More one of my favorites. He's from, he's from, uh, he's from like Redwood City or Mountain View. I went skating with him once and it was fucking amazing. I had a great day. He's just got the best style. People will be hyped I said that, huh? Because I think people on Slap love him. He's like a Slap, uh, yeah, he's, a he's a patron yeah. saint. Yeah, he's a favorite. <laughs> Pappy Jones says, thanks for taking the time, Mark. Thank you. Favorite Philly skater, OG and more current. Uh, Ricky O. More current, Dylan Sauerbeer. Fucking really sick. And then Ishad kind of just spans. <laughs> he's the, the umbrella over those two. You had some clips in 11th hour. Then later in an Atlantic Drift episode, how'd you meet Jake and Co? Any story you could share from that? Well, I met Tom Knox when I was 13, skating in Paris on another family trip. I just hung out with Tom and the friends that he was on a skate trip with. Jake wasn't there, Jake Harris. I got to know Tom pretty well. We are the same age and we were both really into skating stairs and I just uh, perfected my British accent that week. So much so that Nestor Judkins, who had just seen me at Sunnyvale Skate Park, saw me in Paris and didn't think it was me. I went up to him and I said, hey, uh, Nestor, right? I, I let you use my tool at Sunnyvale like two weeks ago. And he's like, oh shit, I didn't think that was you. I heard the British accent. I didn't see Tom again until 2013 when I was staying in when I was in Europe plans to go to London and I just hit up some people to try to find a couch to stay on and Arthur Darien reached out to me because he had heard that I was looking and he invited me to stay at his place where Jake lived and where Tom would always come over so that was two weeks of just chilling and Jake and I by that time were pretty similar human beings reading the same books and uh, being super psyched on literature and on uh, film and trying to come up with creative things to skate we so that we filmed those clips then, the 11th hour clips. And then in the Atlantic Drift episode, he came out, stayed in New York and I just skated with him. Any good stories? That staying for two weeks in London was one of my favorite trips ever. The flat, it was above a falafel shop in, uh, it was above a falafel shop in Camberwell Green. Good greasy spoons around the corner. Jake would make coffee in the morning. We'd wake up at two, go skating all day and then and then we'd stay out until five and like, as a skater, it's easy to make friends. But back then when you were a kid, it was so much easier because you were just like, the world was open to you. I remember being really good friends with the Blobbies on that same trip. And like, they taught me how to either Kevin Rodriguez or, or uh, Vincent Tuz taught me how to open a beer bottle with a knife. And I do it all the time. And I always forget that it comes from being super close with the Blobbies. What's up with your recent cross-country drive? Do you prefer driving over flying if you have the time? Yeah, I definitely do. I, I don't mind flying. I'm chill with flying. But I thought to drive this time because of COVID. The flight I'd taken out to California was packed, even though they said there were going to be free middle seats. And uh, there was not, so that sketched me out a little bit. And then I had accumulated so much shit in those three months. It was my birthday and my girlfriend gave me a frying pan. And... Uh, I was like, I can't fucking fly back with all this shit. So driving just made more sense. But I just, I love driving because I'm just always fucking so inspired by the names of towns. You know, like Topeka. That's such a fucking sick word. <laughs> but it was, it, I had such a good time there. Dennis Buznitz, when I got into Kansas, he texted me ideas for, for tricks. I was like, yo, I'm driving into Kansas today. You're from here. And he said, oh shit. You're gonna go by Wichita, and I wasn't, but you're gonna go by my old town. I wasn't going through those places because I just wanted to go to Topeka, but I was like, I didn't tell him that, and I just went and I saw where he grew up skating, like the box in the front yard and all that shit. It was super sick. Favorite book or series from your childhood, younger years? That's Philip Pullman, His Dark Materials trilogy. Ever skated in Seattle? Yeah, I love Seattle. I, I really like skating the Jimi Hendrix School and the brick double set. The Jimi Hendrix School is the concrete. Yeah. It's like rough. Right? Yeah, super. Yeah. They're like not really even banks, they're like wall rides. <laughs> that rail is one of the, it's amazing. The dimensions are so good. It's like steep, but approachable but and like, not tall. It's like the same. But it grinds all right, it's fine. Because yeah, they lacquer it. Behavioral Guide asks, podcast you listen to? I like to listen to the New Yorker Fiction podcast and the New York Times The Daily. That one's just short and it actually goes into depth about the news you're reading. On the road trip I had a lot of time for podcasts and I had a lot of suggestions coming in from people and I listened to some really good ones. Somebody, one of my friends, 
told me I should listen to a Reply All podcast, number 158, The Case of the Missing Hit, and that one was really good. S asks, be honest, what do you like and what do you dislike about competing in Street League? I really like a lot of stuff about it. I thought I wasn't going to like it. I thought I was going to feel like like how Dylan felt when he flipped off the camera. Yeah, when I first saw Street League, I was so offended. And I think if I did it back then, I would have not liked it. But you think it's such an insult that you could name, you could give a trick a number. But then when you're there, it's like, oh wait, that shit doesn't matter. And they're all wrong anyways. <laughs> Everybody, the whole time, they're like, boo. You know, and, and then it's, it's clear. It's like, it's a small obstacle. And he did a fucked up trick. But then I just switch lip slid the big rail and I get two more points, two more full points. Like that's a first try, every try trick. How are you going to give that, you know, that it does not work. Yeah, it's hard to differentiate. So it's so blatantly wrong that it was innocuous. The sickest thing about Street League is that I gained ESP or whatever that shit's called. I knew if I was going to land a trick like 15 seconds before I was going to do it. It's something about it. Like when you're that attuned, when you're that focused, you just fucking know. Like you, I dropped in on the ramp knowing that I wasn't going to do this back smith. I mean, obviously that could be like I manifested it, but I just felt off and I was like, oh fuck. And I felt like I was falling from 15 seconds before. And then when I'm going to land, like I could be, I could be tripping on a line. Like, fuck, why did I pick these tricks? What? They're so hard. God damn it, I can't even land this one. And then my run comes and I'm just on. And I, like, not a negative thought is in my head. I'm like, boom, boom, you're going to do this one. And do this one. But, you know, and then all of a sudden there's one little thing that comes off. The way that I, ca- the, the way that I pump the tranny and all of a sudden it's off and I know the next trick's done, you know? So that's, that's really cool. I thought it made me, it's not like I can do that when I'm street skating now, but I almost feel it sometimes, so uh, it made me more in tune with my skating. Cool, that's it. Thanks a lot for submitting your questions, folks. That real live shit.